here we find ourselves in a grand ballroom. Now let's imagine a scenario where we have a group of individuals who are being uh, joined by their escorts and are waiting for individuals to come into the room to partner up with, to dance with. Well, as soon as one person comes into the room, somebody who is waiting pairs up with them and we have a dancing couple. And then the escorts go off and separate and congregate in other areas of the room and observe the dancing. And as more individuals come in, as soon as they come in, they're paired up. And so every time that a new individual comes in, they get paired up and they have a dance partner and we have a dancing couple and we have escorts that are observing all of these dancing couples. Eventually what's going to happen is that we're going to have no more individuals waiting with their escorts. Everybody's going to be paired up and dancing. But uh-oh, there are more individuals coming into the room than there are individuals waiting. So eventually what happens is that we have all of these dancing couples except there are some individuals coming in and finding that they don't have a dance partner. What a dilemma. Now, what does this have to do with what we're going to discuss today, acid-base titrations? Well, it's, as you probably have imagined, an analogy. We can talk about acids and bases that are in these titrations as being dancing couples that ultimately are going to make up water and some observant ions. So, let's try and take this from the dance floor to the chemistry room. feel a bit underdressed for this. So if you've been in a chemistry lab or a science lab, you've probably seen a piece of equipment that is a long cylindrical glass tube and has a stopper on it. And ultimately what that is, is a piece of equipment that we call a burette. And some of you may have even performed titrations before. And ultimately what a titration is, is that it's trying to determine the concentration of an unknown solution by reacting it with a solution of a known concentration. And the ones that we're going to focus on are acid-base reactions in which an acid is titrated against a base or vice versa. So let's take a look at a scenario where we're trying to establish the concentration of an unknown acid. Now, the substance that is being uh, titrated, we often refer to that as the analyte. That is the substance that is being analyzed, and in this case, it is the acid. But it could just as easily be a base. The substance that we know the concentration of, we refer to that as the titrant. And if our unknown is an acid, our titrant is going to be a base. And if our unknown or analyte is a base, our titrant is going to be the acid. Remember, the acid is the, or the titrant is the substance that you always know the concentration of. Let's take a look at what we're starting with. Initially, we have a base as our titrant, and if we wanted to establish the pH of this base, we could establish the concentration of the hydroxide ions that are in this particular titrant. That is the substance that's in the burette. We have to note that if it's a strong base, we can just use the concentration of the hydroxide ions, assuming it's readily soluble, to figure out the pOH and then ultimately the pH of the base. If it were a weak base, we would have to use Kb and our equilibrium scenarios or ice tables in order to figure out uh, what the concentration of hydroxide is and then ultimately the pH and the pOH. Now, our analyte in this case is going to be an acid. And if it's a strong acid, we can just assume that the concentration of the acid, assuming it's a monoprotic acid, is going to be the concentration of the hydronium ions. And we can figure out its initial pH from there. If it's a weak acid, again, we would have to treat it as an equilibrium scenario, and we would have to figure out what the concentration of the hydronium is based on the Ka and the relationships between the acid and its resultant ions. Let's take a look at this titration as it progresses. As we first begin to add base, or our titrant, what we're going to notice immediately is that the volume is going to start to rise in our Erlenmeyer flask containing the analyte or unknown. We're going to notice that since the volume rises, the concentration of the acid is going to decrease, partly because the volume of the solvent has increased, but also because the hydroxide ions that are being introduced are reacting with the hydrogen or hydronium ions and are producing uh, the products. We're also going to start to notice that the concentration of the salt is going to increase as well. Now the base, if we take a look at that concentration, the base is still going to be negligible in that particular um, analyte solution because as soon as the base is being introduced, it is then being converted into salt and water. Now as we continue to add more and more of the base, or ultimately the titrant, what we're going to reach at some point is something called a midpoint. 
And once we've hit that midpoint, that's when half of the acidic hydrogens have reacted. Remember, in our case, we're looking at that analyte as being acidic. In the case of it being basic, it would be half of the hydroxides. But when half of them have been uh, reacted in this process, we have reached our midpoint. So what we have is still half of the acidic hydrogens unreacted, and now we have a concentration of salt. And effectively, at midpoint, those two concentrations are equal. So the concentration of the hydrogen ions has come down, the concentration of the salt has gone up and at midpoint those two concentrations are equal. Now what we have here is we still don't have any base in the solution okay? because as soon as it's introduced it's used and then the volume of the solution is still going to increase. We have a 50-50 mixture between the acid and the salt and the pH has started to increase and again it started to increase because the concentration of the acid has started to go down. All right, we're going to continue through this, and as we do, eventually we're going to reach something which is really the purpose of going through these types of uh, activities, going through these titrations, and that is to reach something called the equivalence point. And the equivalence point is reached when all of the original acid has completely reacted with the base. So at this point, take a look at it more generally, at this point the analyte and the titrants have completely reacted with one another. So what that means at this point is that it's all salt and water. There is no acid, there is no base in excess. So we have nothing but a salt solution when we have reached the equivalence point. There's still no uh, significant amount of base or acid in the solution at this particular time. The volume has increased significantly from when we first started the titration in most cases, and the pH and this is important here, the pH could either be neutral, basic, or acidic. And we're going to take a look at why that might be in, in a subsequent vodcast. But keep note of this, that is again, the pH of this does not have to be neutral. Even though there may be no acid or no base, it doesn't mean that the solution itself is neutral. We can also go past the point of equivalence. That is, we can over titrate a solution. We can add more of the uh, titrant than is needed to reach equivalence. So once we do that, we have over titrated and we're going to have excess titrant. So in our example, we would have excess base, thereby making the solution basic and having a really high pH. Now, for us, when we perform these types of titrations, again, the whole point is to establish the equivalence point so we can figure out the concentration of the unknown through stoichiometric calculations. But what's important for us is to be able to identify when that happens. And we have to look for something called the endpoint. And indicators help us do that. And you've probably used indicators before. They are substances that are going to change color depending on various pHs of the solution. So what we have to do is establish what the pH is going to be of a particular titration and try and figure out what an a good indicator would be to identify that we have reached that equivalence point. So an endpoint is when the indicator changes color. The equivalence point is when you have the acid and base completely reacted. So what you're looking for is an endpoint and an equivalence point that are going to be as close together as you can possibly have. And that you can find an indicator that will do that is going to be an effective indicator. Back to our original analogy, if we think about the dance and we think about a titration, if we have in our scenario an unknown acid, these are the individuals that are already at the dance waiting for their partners. As we start to add the other dancers, the base, as soon as the hydrogen and hydroxide pair up, they go off and dance as the water molecule and the people that they came in with, their escorts, they go off and watch this whole thing occur. So the escorts effectively are going to form the ions that ultimately make up the salt. And again, as we continue on with this pairing up of dancers, we're going to reach a point where the number of couples dancing is equal to the number of individuals who don't have partners. That would be our midpoint. When all of the dancers have matched up, we have reached our equivalence point. And if we have dancers come in and there's already everybody paired up dancing, we are going to have over titrated. So hopefully that analogy helped a little bit understanding uh, the process and ultimately the purpose of titrations.
And I want you to take a look at some of those calculations and when you're going through that, hopefully that analogy will help you out. Thanks for watching.